Yapulingina. Hello and welcome. My name is Fred Gale. As a professor of politics and international relations in the School of Social Sciences at the University of Tasmania, and as co-chair of Global Climate Change Week, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the launch of Global Climate Change Week 2022. I speak to you today from the lands of the letter of Mariner, who hunted and gathered, spoke their language, practiced their culture, and lived, laughed, and loved on the shores of the Kanamaluka, today known as the Tamar River in the north of the island we also call Lutruwita, Tasmania. I mourn the devastating impacts of the Lutruwita's uh, indigenous peoples uh, and their languages and, the, uh, and their culture at the hands of an enlightenment ideology so blinded by its own truth that it failed and continues to fail to recognize the truths of others. I acknowledge the deep wrongs visited on the Palawa peoples of Lutruwita through invasion and settlement, recognize the work being done by the Tasmanian Aboriginal Center re to recover what has been lost and pay my deep respects to elders past, present and emerging. I invite you to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands uh, you are participating from by posting a message in the Q&A function. Before I introduce our moderator, there's a few housekeeping uh, details I'd like to uh, provide you with. Your microphone, camera, chat function and raised hand function have all been disabled to prevent disruptions. We do encourage you to ask questions though, uh, and this can be done at any time by typing them into the Q&A function that you can see on the bottom of the screen. You can ask questions anonymously if you wish, and we will address as many questions as possible later in the session. Please pose your questions uh, during the speaker's presentations um, uh, as the, uh, as, yeah, so that we have a collection of them at the end uh, that we can address quite quickly. We're going to be conducting some polls during this webinar. We'd love to know more about who you are and what you think through the, out the discussion, so please feel free to participate. And finally, this lecture is being recorded for later access on YouTube and SoundCloud. We'll provide the details on where to find the links as well as the uh, other uh, links to Island of Ideas public lecture series at the end of the session. This Global Climate Change Week launch event is part of the University of Tasmania's Island of Ideas series, which commenced in 2020. At the time, the series was viewed as a way of keeping our community and ideas connected when the university was unable to host face-to-face -face events. Today, we continue to host these forums since creating and sharing ideas and perspectives is a critical feature of the university system, and it enables our university to connect the ideas and people of Tasmania to a global network. This series helps us collaborate and discuss emerging ideas and work towards a brighter, sustainable future for and from Tasmania and across the world. Which brings me to Global Climate Change Week itself. Today, by the Island of Ideas series, we are launching Global Climate Change Week by convening a special public forum. Global Climate Change Week, which we often abbreviate to GCCW since otherwise it's a bit of a mouthful, was launched in 2015 by two academics at the University of Wollongong. After five successful years, the University of Tasmania took over stewardship in 2020 for a second lustrum. In part, it was UTAS's carbon emissions credentials that ensured we were considered as the next hosts of Global Climate Change Week. The University of Tasmania has been carbon neutral since 2016 and has since divested from fossil fuel companies and was ranked first in the Tasmanian, uh, sorry, in the Times Higher Education Ranking Performance against SDG 13, which is for climate action. This was just ahead of, uh, well, Tasmania's performance was actually just ahead of uh, the University of uh, Victoria in British Columbia, which uh, coincidentally is where I worked before I arrived in Tasmania 20 years ago. So if you can find a causal connection, I'd be very interested. Global Climate Change Week is a grassroots platform bringing academics and students and professional staff in universities and colleges together with their communities to advance knowledge and action on what is in every way the existential crisis of our time. This year's theme is climate health justice, 
and across the world, Global Climate Change Week has encouraged universities and colleges to organize events, um, both large and small, and take action on this theme. It thus gives me great pleasure to launch uh, Global Climate Change Week 2022 with a forum precisely on this topic, climate emergency equals health emergency. This discussion is important at a local and global scale, and our star-studded panel of experts are going to provide a 360 degree reflection on how to think and act in relation to it. To host the discussion, it is my very great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Professor Catherine Bowen. Catherine holds a joint position as Deputy Director, Melbourne Climate Futures, and as Professor, Environment, Climate and Global Health in the School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne's Faculty of Medicine. Catherine is a leading international expert on science and policy of sustainability, particularly climate change and global health issues. She has 20 years experience in original public health research, science assessment, capacity development and policy advice, and has published extensively on these topics, including recently in Lancet Planetary Health and Nature Climate Change. Catherine is also a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 2, playing a critical role in reviewing and interpreting the impacts of climate change and health. Given that background, it's evident Catherine could just have easily been a panel member, member as a moderator. However, the GCCW team thought it critical to have someone of her calibrator mo moderating the panel to ensure the diversity of ideas and themes get pulled together, the tough questions get identified, and our panelists are encouraged to answer them. So without further ado, welcome to the screen, Catherine. Thank you so much, Fred, for that very generous introduction. It is my great pleasure to be the host for this event today, and I'm thrilled to see the focus on health and justice during this year's Global Climate Change Week. And many thanks to the University of Tasmania and your leadership, Fred, um, and more broadly on all issues climate change related that are um, supported and led by the University of Tasmania. So I won't take too long in, in terms of my introduction, but what I'll just briefly say is that many of us are preparing for the climate negotiations next month in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, what we call the Conference of the Parties or the COP, where the government delegations gather and work towards implementing the goals of the Paris Agreement. And I'm really happy to say that health has increasingly become an important part of this meeting. And this year, the emphasis will continue, particularly with the strong support of the WHO. So we'll all be watching their negotiations with interest. And hopefully in the upcoming COPs, we will start to see more health representatives in the government delegations. And that's something that I'm personally working on very closely with governments. So I'm really keen to listen to our panellists and to move on to the presentation part of today. So I will now introduce all of our speakers for this session. So I'll start with uh, Dr. Veronica Matthews. Uh, welcome, Veronica. Veronica is the Director of the Centre for Research Excellence, Strengthening Systems for Indigenous Healthcare Equity, otherwise known as CRE Stride, at the University of Sydney in Australia. Uh, Dr. Bob Mantiao, welcome Bob. Bob is a Senior Research Fellow at the University of Ghana. Today he's coming to us from Canada. Um, Professor Sharon Freel, welcome Sharon. Sharon is the Laureate Professor of Health Equity at the Australian National University. Professor Eugenie Kayak, welcome Eugenie. Uh, Eugenie is the University of Melbourne's Enterprise Professor in Sustainable Healthcare, sitting in the Melbourne Medical School. Ms Rhiannon Osborne, welcome Rhiannon. Rhiannon is a medical student at Cambridge University. And finally, to round out our impressive panel, is Professor Deborah McGregor, who is the Canada Research Chair focusing on Indigenous environmental justice at York University. So I'm thrilled to see the diversity in the panel today and the different perspectives we will hear from each panellist. And we will move straight into the presentations from our panellists. So I'd like to welcome Veronica to begin. 
Thanks so much, uh, Catherine, and thank you, Fred, and to the organizing committee for inviting me along to this discussion. I am a Kondamuka woman from Manjaraba, which is a, a sand island just off the coast of, of Brisbane, but I do live in and work. I have the privilege of, of living on Widgeable Wyable country in um, the beautiful northern rivers of New South Wales, where uh, I'm at the University Centre for, for Rural Health, and I prim primarily work as a health systems researcher there. I would also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the, the land that we're zooming in from today. And, and for me, I'm actually sitting here in Brisbane on, on, on terrible Jagera country. And I thank ancestors and elders for their, for their wisdom careful custodianship of, of country that we all get to enjoy today. So I'll, I'll be contributing some thoughts from a, an Australian First Nations perspective about the importance of, of health of, of country, for the health of our well-being, and how the climate emergency is, is threatening that connection. And most importantly, what we can do to put First Nations rights at the forefront of climate planning and policy. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that First Nations have a holistic view of health. So for us, it's it's more than just the state of your physical and mental health. It also encompasses our relationship to land, culture and communities. And for millennia, our, ours has been a reciprocal relationship. We, we have always been caretakers of, of country, maintaining balance, enhancing biodiversity and in return, country has, has nourished us physically, mentally, spiritually, and, and culturally. So this disconnection, as Fred was talking about earlier, um, this connection was, was disrupted by, by colonization, which has led to the, the stark health and, and socioeconomic disparities that we see today, where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have around a 10 year gap in life expectancy compared to non-Indigenous Australians. And climate change is viewed by First Nations both here and globally as an extension of, of colonisation because we continue to lack control over what is happening to our country and therefore what, what is happening to our social and emotional well-being. Uh, we all are already disproportionately bearing the brunt of extreme weather right, right across Australia, um, extreme floods where I live in the Northern Rivers, we've had two already this year, where First Nations people are more likely to live in, in those flood impacted zones. Rising sea levels in the Torres Strait, which are, are washing away livelihoods and, and culture. And the extreme unbearable heat that Central Australian communities are experiencing are just um, a few examples. And there are rolling there are rolling consequences to this extreme weather. So First Nations communities uh, are, have, have reduced access to bush tucker and, and water resources that are freely available. Often Aboriginal housing infrastructure is not adequately protective. For example, most uh, remote housing in areas where it is getting hotter doesn't even meet basic standards when it comes to insulation and shade structures that protect from heat. So all of this will um, exacerbate already unacceptable levels of chronic disease in our communities. However, we are resilient despite challenges of colonization over 200 years, Australian Aboriginal culture is the earth's oldest, thriving and surviving for over 60,000 years. Our ancestors have adapted to major climatic shifts over millennia. So our, our, our knowledge is both ancient and new. The problem now is that the climatic shift is happening at a comparatively rapid rate. So it is presenting quite complex challenges and, and we do lack rights over proper access to traditional lands to fully continue our, our cultural responsibilities in caring for country. So our knowledges have inherent value and um, we know how to manage country so that it supports biodiversity, enhances um, resilience, there, there is now emerging recognition of this and increasing calls from organisations like the IPCC to listen to First Nations knowledges to inform climate change mitigation and adaptation. We may have the know-how to contribute to the climate change issue, but for too long, 
uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities like First Nations elsewhere haven't really been listened to and we lack the resources and at the moment here the political clout to contribute to effective climate planning and to, to ensure that we don't maladapt as we transition to renewable energy and other adaptations. Um, we need to make sure that, that these um, advances benefit our, our community as well. So similar experiences for other First Nations people, I'm sure, which is why we have seen many communities turning to climate litigation. A recent case here, which um, a couple of weeks ago was that was a landmark decision by the United Nations, um, ruling in favour of Torres Strait Islander peoples over a claim made by them against the previous Australian government for a violation of human rights by their inaction on climate change due to the impact it had on the Torres Strait Islander livelihoods and, and culture. Significantly with this decision, the, the UN listened to Indigenous cultural and ecological knowledge rather than um, Western explanations and, and climate science. They took account of Torres Strait Islanders' connection to country across land and seas, as well as to culture and their ability to maintain these. So from this, the UN has recommended the Australian government compensate um, Torres Strait Islanders for the harms already suffered and have, have called for meaningful consultation with, with communities and funding of adaptation measures. We still wait to, um, to hear the response from, from the Australian government on this. But these, these types of decisions means governments around the world need to ensure that Indigenous rights are upheld as part of climate policy and planning. So while, while not legally blocked, Binding, I was thinking through how we can keep the momentum up here in Australia. And I, I believe there is a convergence of, of opportunity. There has been a recent change in political leadership. Um, the, the new leaders appear more conducive to act on, on the climate emergency, although the jury still is out given the still stubborn um, commitments to fossil fuel projects. However, they also have a willingness to, to back the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which is a a grassroots statement from, from um, many years of consultation with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities across the country, which is calling for a permanent voice to parliament enshrined in our constitution. And I'm not sure how well it's known that Australia remains the only Commonwealth country to have never signed a treaty with its First Nations people. This voice would give us the ability to negotiate a treaty and compensation in form of resourcing communities for self-determination, improving social determinants, health, which in turn will improve community adaptive capacity in preparing and mitigating against climate risk. Through treaty processes, we must address the ongoing denial of the true history of our country, and this will require respectful discussions. We need to be open to other perspectives about our history, but also the contemporary forces that maintain injustice and inequity. So I'll just I'll leave you by by this by thinking through you know we, we do need these these genuine partnerships as the foundation to climate solutions. So listening to mob, listening to our knowledges, and ultimately we need to relearn principles of our ancestors and and acting reciprocally and responsibly to look after country. Um, and really, this is for the future generations, for the benefit of all Australians. So I really encourage non-indigenous allies. Uh, here and, and across the world to demand reform and support the Uluru Statement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica, for that articulate explanation of the, the urgency that we have to take um, action around climate change, particularly with a focus on First Nations voices and um, I agree that the 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 ruling that was that was um, handed down a couple of weeks ago is is really pointing us in a positive direction, and I think the precedents from those types of rulings show that governments do pay attention to them. So I'm watching with keen interest to see whether our Australian government will also um, action that as well. So many thanks for that, Veronica. We'll move um, now um, on to. Uh, Dr. Bob Mantiao, and I just remind the audience to please um, think about your questions and pop them in the Q&A as we go along. So um, welcome, Bob. Okay, thanks, Catherine, and thanks, uh, Fred. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks to all the organisers, and uh, I appreciate the invitation to be part of this uh, conversation. 
My name is Bob Montiel. Uh, uh, I'm originally from Ghana, and um, I currently work at the University of Ghana, the Climate Change Center, as a senior research fellow. Uh, my research interest uh, is in climate adaptation governance, climate adaptation and sustainable development governance. And I have a particular interest in uh, climate change and health nexus, uh, planetary health framing, uh, impacts of climate change in marginalized communities, and uh, building anticipatory and adaptive ca uh, capacities within these communities. Um, I am currently in Canada. Um, I came to Canada not too long ago, and it just happened that I have to do this. I have to join this conversation from here. But then interestingly, uh, uh, it is also important for me to um, say that I have lived in Canada um, for quite some time. I still maintain a base here. And while I was here permanently, uh, I worked for the government of Alberta and I was the, uh, the provincial lead for climate adaptation planning. So as part of that work, uh, I was very much involved in um, indigenous communities, uh, trying to uh, help in the mobilization of uh, resources and also building capacity for ad uh, climate adaptation. Uh, I somehow identified myself very much with indigenous communities and, and for the reason that as an African, uh, a continental African, having migrated from Africa, there were a lot of commonalities between the lives that we lead in Africa and also what I saw in indigenous communities. So some of what I'll be talking about, uh, climate change and health in Africa um, and Ghana to be specific, are very much uh, some of the things that I think uh, we will be talking about here from an indigenous uh, culture perspective. So basically what I'm going to talk about is I want to let's look at the climate and health nexus in Africa with a focus on Ghana. What I mean by climate and health nexus, I want us to look at, uh, I want to talk about current uh, awareness levels, current appreciation and current manifestation of climate impacts in uh, communities, which I would describe as marginalized communities. Uh, some of the work that we have done is focused on um, urban areas and rural areas. Uh, the dichotomy is only in the names of being urban or being rural, but the nature of impact, the nature of manifestation and how people are responding or not is almost the same in both of these communities. The first thing I want to say is much as climate impacts have become pervasive uh, and um, evident in a lot of local communities, not a lot of people are making the connection between climate change and health. Uh, even the scholarship, the research and scholarship uh, at this point is very nascent in, in most of Africa. And the reason is, um, the much as people understand that climate change is ongoing, there hasn't been any conscious effort for to make that connection between common everyday diseases and the, the changes that we are experiencing uh, as far as climate change is concerned. A good example is my own uh, experiences with uh, health professionals, uh, medical doctors. And I've had extensive con uh, conversation with some medical doctors whom I've gone to see for my own health reasons. And they would ask me, what do I do for a living? And I'll tell them I work in climate change. And then they would very uh, instantly uh, have some interest in, so they would tell me what is going on with this climate change thing? And then I would also very deliberately start from climate change and health. So point out to them uh, the links between climate change and the work they are doing in terms of uh, managing health they become surprised. They had never thought about their own work in the way that I had described, for instance, floods and increases in um, malaria incidents. They had ever talked about rising temperatures and air pollution and how that contributes to respiratory diseases. They had never talked about, thought about um, 
drought and skin diseases. So I point these out to them and they become, they suddenly become interested. But I remember once in the consulting room with a doctor, uh, we spent quite close to an hour talking about climate change and health and not my, not for the reason that I went there, but climate change and health generally, because he was curious. So he invited me over for us to have continue the conversation, which we did. The point I'm making as far as this is concerned is, yes, uh, we are experiencing the impacts of climate change in different sectors, including health, but not a lot of people, not a lot of entities, not a lot of organizations, including the medical sector, uh, have an awareness or understand the complexity of what they do and uh, the changing climatic conditions. This is not surprising, uh, and obviously because we do have, we, we tend to think there are other more important priorities. But then, which of course is uh, issues of agriculture, issues of uh, food security. But even in food security, when we talk about, when we look at uh, the impact of climate change on the quality of food that people consume, recent studies that I was directly involved in had shown that there is a clear link between uh, household adaptive capacity and their ability to afford certain levels of nutrition. And if that is not available, I mean, if you are not able to afford uh, certain levels of nutrition, then what it means is it has health implication. And we had cases of stunting in children in some parts of Ghana. Some work that we have done in urban areas, uh, as far as climate change and health is concerned, we took and that is what I mean, that's what the justice as aspect comes in. We took um, slum communities in parts of Accra, which is the capital of Ghana, obviously because of uh, increase, uh, increases in population and migration from rural communities into urban areas. Accra is best in that it seems as far as population is concerned and housing has, be, uh, has become a major issue. So slum communities are on the rise. So we decided to look at what climate change impacts look like in some selected slum communities. And interestingly, we found a clear link. We found increases in um, malaria cases. We found increases in skin diseases. We found respiratory uh, health challenges on the rise. We also found that the frequent floods and drought cycles are sort of creating a lot of mental health issues because which a lot of the people that we dealt with in these communities were not even aware. We also were involved in certain studies in the Northern part of Ghana, which is generally dry. But then, uh, and there has been a history of uh, cerebrospinal meningitis, which is a seasonal weather changing kind of thing. We have noticed that in recent times, there has been incidents of um, the, the disease coming up, rising. And obviously because of um, current changes that are being observed in these communities. What we are doing currently is we have embarked on, uh, uh, as part of our studies that we did in the Islam communities, we have embarked on uh, a kind of a vulnerability assessment across the country looking at the linkages between climate change health, and then look at the levels of adaptive capacity, what kind of resources are available, what kind of agency uh, sources that are available, and how we could help build the capacity of local people. And when I used to talk about local people here, I'm talking about those that we consider as being living in marginalized areas in the communities. And those are the people that are actually bearing the brunt uh, of changing climatic conditions in, in Accra. The other thing too is because of because there hasn't been any conscious effort to link uh, climate change impacts and health, the scholarship, research and scholarship around that is, is very nascent. It's just building up. There have been pockets here done, pockets of studies done here and there. But what we're trying to get the government to understand is we need to get focused attention on climate change and health. 
So my center, for instance, at the university, we have a course, a proposed course in uh, a graduate level course in climate change and health as part of the programs that we offer. And we hoping that um, through processes like this and activities like this, we will be able to, uh, you know, create the requisite awareness and build the requisite capacity through students' training uh, and research, so we can help uh, facilitate the building of adaptive capacity and resilience. An area that we are beginning to also link this issue, the issue of climate change and health to is the issue of planetary health generally. Uh, and that is an area that I um, am very much um, at the forefront of, and then hoping that with conversations like what we're having and knowing what others are doing, we could form some kind of collaboration and then uh, deepen the efforts that we are making to, to, to strengthen uh, education and learning in both planetary health and climate change and health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. That was wonderful to hear of your experiences uh, working on the research issue, but also your advocacy efforts outside of your professional role. So uh, I think many of us empathise that when we're often in day-to-day -day circumstances, we do talk about this issue. And so it really pervades all aspects of our lives. So thank you so much for those examples. We'll move now to Professor Sharon Friel. So welcome, Sharon, and I think you've got some slides to share. Thank you, Catherine uh, and Fred and colleagues. Uh, really lovely to join you. Uh, I join you this morning uh, from Canberra, uh, and I acknowledge uh, the first Australians. I'm here on Nanawal uh, lands. Uh, that's where I'm talking to you from, uh, and really just to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So I want to talk about some work that we're doing, uh, or a body of work around planetary health equity. If you're interested in this intersection between climate change, inequalities and health, uh, and really the question of governance, and we've set up recently this new planetary health equity hothouse, The first thing I suppose I want to say when we think about the, the massive inequities that are associated uh, with climate change is the intergenerational inequities that are currently locked in. So previous and current uh, generations generally in high income countries uh, have put in place these massive intergenerational inequities through all of the greenhouse gas emissions and all the other forms of environmental destruction that they have done. And so we've got that locked in uh, and there's worse to come. So thinking about climate justice, thinking about intergenerational inequities. And we've heard from uh, two colleagues already about this relationship between climate change and health, a massive, a massive, uh, really existential threat for us uh, in this century going forward. So as temperatures go up, uh, so does heat exhaustion, heat stroke, cardiovascular disease and kidney diseases. The rising temperatures also worsen air pollution, increases ground le level uh, ozone smog. The dirtier air linked to higher hospital emissions uh, and higher death rates uh, for asthmatics and people suffering from cardiac and pulmonary disease. As we have the land uh, and sea undergoing these massive rapid changes, animals that inhibit uh, these areas will disappear if they don't adapt quickly enough. And just think without pollinators, our food security uh, becomes an issue and already is an issue. We're certainly experiencing the impacts of climate change uh, on our mental health, and I'll come back to that shortly. And uh, we have the risks, uh, for not only uh, to these issues that I've spoken about already, uh, but also to mosquito-borne diseases uh, starting to increase and move around the world. And 
rising sea level systems uh, threatening our, our coastal systems and low lying areas uh, where many uh, major, major populations uh, currently live. For example, here in Australia, uh, we've got uh, cities like Sydney under threat with incredible risks to life. So it's not good. Uh, and all of that uh, brings the risk to planetary health equity. We have a planetary health inequity crisis. The equitable enjoyment of good health in a stable ecosystem is becoming a real uh, challenge. And within countries, we see this confluence of climate change, its risks to intergenerational inequities, the added pressures on economic inequities across the globe uh, and the existing social disadvantage and that relationship with health. And uh, Veronica has also uh, is, has already mentioned about the experiences in part of Australia. This is uh, an image from Lismore uh, Town Centre. So really just this example of the Australian uh, floods, which are pictured here. So in 2022, this year, 82% of people living in Lismore uh, foot, uh, footprint area resided in the most um, disadvantaged socioeconomic uh, neighbourhoods. So that was where the floods uh, hit. Back in 2017, uh, the Northern Rivers flood event, um, which also included uh, Lismore, was no different. The majority of people who were directly affected in the flooded area came from socially uh, disadvantaged uh, communities. Those communities were the communities much more likely to be evacuated. They were much more likely to be displaced for long periods of time. And they were the communities much more likely to experience the worst mental health and well-being outcomes. And the point to note is very little changed in the daily living conditions for those communities between 2017 and 2022, resulting in that completely inadequate and inequitable adaptation. So if we're going to think about equity and climate change in relation to health, we've got to think about the underlying social conditions in which people already live. And we're not doing that sufficiently. But then, really, if we want to do something about this relationship between climate change and health, we've got to think about mitigation. And we have got to think about what I refer to as the consumptogenic system. The system of institutions, of policies, of business practices, of norm, institutional and social norms, that absolutely incentivize and reward the excessive production and consumption of really fossil fuel reliant goods and services, that many of them are not good for human health and they're very unequally distributed and valued. So this isn't just about what you and me put in our mouths or the way that we behave, this is about the systems of production as well. So we've got to really address this consumptogenic system. And to do that, and you know, this isn't going to be a rocket science for many of you listening, but we absolutely need a really progressive public policy that thinks about the um, climate chain or the climate outcomes. It thinks about the social outcomes and it thinks about the health outcomes together. And this is about you think mitigation uh, policy uh, in a way that really tries to optimize these different outcomes. We also have to think about what's the role of the market in all of this. The market isn't going away uh, at all, of course, um, but the recalibration of market activity to make sure that it serves these planetary health equity outcomes and interests. So not just about market for profit purposes, that's important, but it's got to serve these interests of planetary health equity as well. And fundamentally, this is all about a governance reset. 
the steering, the course of events and the, the who's who in the zoo uh, to really guide, elevate the interests of planetary health equity. And I would say we do not have a fit for purpose uh, governance system at the moment. But I do take hope. Uh, I think there's hope and it comes to this question of recognizing that uh, climate change and this relationship with climate change and health is not a technical issue. It is very much an ethical pursuit. It's very much a political uh, struggle. It's very much about uh, structural change and civil society is a key prong in that governance uh, system for planetary health equity. Civil society, NGOs, grassroots movements, uh, academic activists uh, working in different places and different scales, using different strategies, really articulating a vision and values uh, to get to action on those structural drivers. Civil society groups, really important uh, to uh, raise the collective consciousness to um, bring the evidence to bear, to articulate a, a different vision, uh, to hold government and business to account. And I just put some examples uh, of civil society organisations on the screen. Uh, there are, of course, many, many others. And the key point is the coalitions. The key the, the coalitions organizing together the unusual bedfellows demanding this shared vision for uh, planetary health equity. So that really is all, all I wanted to say. If you want to join us in the Planetary Health Equity Hothouse, all concerned about governance for planetary health equity, we can see the, the details there on the screen and we can share them in the chat if that's useful. So I'll stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's a wonderful initiative, the Hot House. I would encourage um, those who are interested to have a look and to um, take up Sharon's offer to, to get in touch. So I think, Sharon, you really point out the importance of coalitions and also the importance of looking at this issue in a systems manner as well. So many thanks for your uh, presentation just then. And I'd like to remind our audience to please pop your questions uh, into the Q&A. We'll be moving to that um, very shortly. So the next speaker is Professor Eugenie Kayak. Uh, Eugenie, please, welcome. Thank you, and um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, I'd also like to begin by acknowledging that I'm on the land of the Rwandri people of the Kulin Nation, and also to take a moment to acknowledge their true stewardship of our land for millennia, and as has been pointed out, how much we could learn um, and move forward if we actually took time to listen to our Indigenous voices. So I'm based in Melbourne. Um, I'm the Enterprise Professor in Sustainable Healthcare at the University of Melbourne, but I'm also an anaesthetist in my other job um, in the public and health, um, private healthcare system in Melbourne. And I'm going to touch briefly today on the threats, actions and opportunities in relation to climate change and the healthcare sector. So as I'm sure most many of you are aware, in 2019, many health organisations around the world declared climate change a health emergency. Why? Well, we've heard why already from our previous speakers because of the amplified extreme weather events from global warming and how that's impacting on our health whether it be the heat waves, the direct trauma and death from extreme weather events, changes in vector-borne disease distributions, impacts on our water and food security, mental health, and as has been mentioned, air pollution. That might be air pollution from combustion of fossil fuels or air pollution from fueling, climate change fueling of our wildfires and bushfires. Who can forget, in Australia particularly, but I think globally you are also aware of the unprecedented Black Summer that was experienced in Australia over 2019-20, where there was exceptional demand on the healthcare sector. So not only were there 34 direct deaths from the fire and 
over 10 times that amount from actual bushfire smoke. But our health system was put under extreme pressure, and that's in Australia, a so-called um, developed rich country. We had over 3,000 extra admissions to a hospital from cardiovascular and respiratory um, conditions. And on top of that, another 1,000 or more um, presentations to the emergency department from exacerbations of asthma, demonstrating that it's not just health, our health that is impacted by climate change, but also the ability of the healthcare sector to function and provide appropriate care. Um, yet, paradoxically, the healthcare sector, um, which aims to um, improve and maintain health, is also part of the problem. Globally, if the healthcare sector globally was a nation, it would be the fifth largest um, greenhouse gas emitter. In Australia, the healthcare sector is estimated to be responsible for over 7% of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions not insignificant, and it really does need to get its own house in order. I think there's an ethical imperative that we do. Fortunately, there is rapidly increasing um, interest and action for the health sector to do this. At the um, COP26 conference in Glasgow last year, over 50 countries and now 60 countries participated in the COP26 health program and they committed to strengthen their health system's climate resilience and sustainability, with many of them committing to being net zero by 2050 or earlier for their healthcare sector, affirming the recognition of the urgent need for the sector to get its own house in order and be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Amongst these countries were some of the most vulnerable, such as Fiji, but also some of the largest um, emitters from the healthcare sector, such as the United States. Coming out of that, the Alliance um, for Transformation, Transformative Action on Climate Change, um, on Climate and Health was formed under the um, WHO umbrella to help these countries um, realise their commitments. Or as the Director General of um, WHO has recently said, to make healthcare green. Unfortunately, Australia was missing from this fundamental initiative and is yet to join the Alliance. Pleasingly, New South Wales Health has gone out on a limb and has recently joined the Alliance. Though this doesn't mean that there isn't increasing support in the country and globally for the healthcare sector to um, reach net zero by 2040 or earlier. In Australia, the Australian Medical Association and Doctors for the Environment Australia have jointly called for the sector to be net zero by 2040, but more importantly, to decrease its emissions by 80% by 2030, because really that's what's in line with the science if we're going to have any chance of um, realising the Paris Agreement and keeping global temperatures to 1.5 or 2 degrees. This might seem ambitious, but it is actually in line with the largest healthcare sector in the world, the NHS, which also has vaguely pretty much the same targets, net zero by 2040 and approximately 80% by 2030. Further, the NHS is demanding that its suppliers, all 80,000 of them, meet or beat the NHS's net zero commitment if they're going to continue their re renewing their contracts. I think this is significant because the health sector globally and often um, nationally is an enormous sector. And with this brings opportunities and responsibility to lead, to influence behaviour, purchasing power, and to subsequently help for transformational change across sectors and jurisdictions. As an example, in Australia, the healthcare sector employs over a million people. It's about 10% of our GDP. It's an enormous purchaser, not only of pharmaceuticals and medical supplies, but it's also the biggest purchaser per sector of food in the country and also a significant land holder and energy user. So it can influence so when the Victorian state government, Victoria is the state that I'm based in, which is traditionally a state based on black coal energy or lignite, 
commits to being 100% renewable electricity supply for its public hospitals by 25. I think this has flow on effects that are likely to be significant across the sector, far more than in the healthcare sector. So COVID was urgent, but climate is just as urgent and perhaps even more important. The global response, encouragingly, to COVID, I think, demonstrated how nations across the world can act to protect health. And last year, on the 6th of September, over 200 editorials simultaneously in medical journals across the world acknowledged that many governments had met the threat of the COVID pandemic with unprecedented funding, but they also said that the environment crisis now demands a similar response, and it does. And the healthcare sector needs to be part of that solution. It needs to be net zero by 2040 or earlier. Business as usual is not an option. Business as usual means a child born today will be experiencing a climate that is four degrees warmer than pre-industrial levels. We as a sector and those involved in the sector, I think have a responsibility to lead um, and be part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eugenie. Terrific to hear the perspective from the healthcare sector. And as you point out, the NHS in the UK has a very um, effective template for us to be all looking towards. So let's see if we can really take action on uh, the issues for the healthcare sector. Uh, and so I would now like to invite uh, Rhiannon, please. Rhiannon, welcome. Hi everyone, um, thanks so much and thanks also to the yeah, really amazing previous speakers. Um, so my name is Rhiannon, I'm a final year medical student, um, I'm Armenian and Welsh currently based in Cambridge UK, um, very much one of the past and current imperial cause and drivers of the climate crisis. Um, and yeah, from here I organise with the People's Health Movement, so thanks for putting that on the slide, I was chuffed. Um, so I organise with the People's Health Movement, um, which is a Global South-led health justice movement. Um, and currently my work with them is focusing on this year's People's Health Hearing. Um, and the People's Health Hearing is a deep listening and testimony forum for frontline communities impacted by the violence of extractive industries. Um, I also organise uh, with two campaigns in the UK, um, one to end oil and gas expansion um, and then another slightly broader one um, for a health justice based Green New Deal in the UK. Um, and just to share, which I think is important before I start the content of my talk, that everything I share and know comes from this work in community and solidarity with people, um, none of, like I can't claim anything as like my ideas. Um, and I'll be putting some specific citations and sources in the chat um, after I finish in particular, um, key decolonial and indigenous scholars. Um, so when we start the conversation about climate health, we often start with the health impacts of the climate crisis, which are of course like really, really deeply important to highlight and discuss. Um, but then sometimes we forget to examine how we got here and in particular how our understanding, what our understanding of health is um, and how our understanding of health is shaped and limited by colonial capitalism and how that narrow understanding of health is part of driving the climate and ecological crises as well as many injustices across the world. Um, so before going into kind of the title of my talk, I guess, which is the lies we're told about health, um, I first thought it might be useful to map out extractivism as a concept um, so we can understand the purpose that these narrow conceptions serve. Um, so extractivism is a social economic process of extracting value in order to grow capital and wealth. It's like the core of a capitalist economy um, and it requires wealth to be extracted from people, from their labour, for example, through slavery or exploitation. Um, and it also requires wealth to be extracted from the rest of nature and non-human animals um, through extractive industries, such as the fossil fuel um, mining and industrial agriculture industries. Um, extractivism also creates waste, which is then often dumped back onto the same people and environments who were extracted from in the first place. 
Um, extractivism is a project founded in and fed by colonialism, and that's where we can find the roots of the climate crisis, as other speakers have outlined, um, in the violent capture of land, natural resources and people to enable wealth accumulation. Um, and this exploitation relies on systems such as white supremacy, patriarchy and ableism to devalue life. Um, and as Francoise Verge writes in A Decolonial Feminism, creates a politics of disposable life. Um, and when we look at the industries and practices which are driving the climate crisis, we can see that a politics of disposable life is really at their core. So from industries such as mining, fast fashion, industrial agriculture, they are dumping toxic, toxic waste into ecosystems um, and their workers are living in poverty. People are being poisoned by their pollution and the racialized class-based and gendered politics of the disposable life which is inherent in these industries and the economic system dictates for example whose land is deemed a sacrifice zone for the spillage of fossil fuel companies which communities suffer the most from air pollution who dies in fuel poverty and which um, in the european context which refugees are welcomed and which refugees are drowned in the Mediterranean. And the death that results because of the structural violence of this um, is, yeah, I think really captured by Ruth Wilson Gilmore's definition of racism, um, which is the state sanctioned or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. So without this context, I think our understanding of health and climate is limited. And but with, with this context, we can then see and question how our kind of Western medical conceptions of health are designed to enable this system. So I'm going to outline three kind of lies about health, I guess, which would be cool to discuss with everyone and see what you think as well. Um, so the first is health as an individual property. So under capitalism, health is an individual property determined by your behavior or some organic flaws. And if you're unhealthy, it's because you don't exercise enough or because you drink too much. And while, of course, this might be factors, the emphasis on individual responsibility for health is very deliberate. It's to hide the fact that industries and policies are causing premature death. And related to this, the solution to a health problem can only ever be a medical intervention or a drug. Not that this is not important. My other area of work is access to essential medicines and vaccine apartheid. Um, but the problem is never located at the level of the system which is making someone sick. Um, and this is really well summarized by a recent headline from the New York Times, which read, researchers who study type two diabetes have reached a stark conclusion. There is no device or drug powerful enough to counter the effects of poverty, pollution, stress, a broken food system, cities that aren't walkable and inequitable access to healthcare. So the truth is that many of the industries, practices and policies, even before we get to the emissions of the industries which are causing the climate crisis, um, they are causing health inequalities. So from everything from resource hoarding by the rich to car dependence, um, these are all industries which were already destroying our health. Um, but of course, it's very convenient if this can all be blamed on individual behavior or biology, which is what you saw um, in the States where oil companies blame the health disparities caused by their pollution on um, like kind of very racial eugenics ideas of individual biological flaws. Um, and I think related to this is we are taught that health is disconnected from the health of other people. So societies based on inequality and exploitation going. Um, and key to this is the scarcity myth, right? The idea that there's not enough resources for us all to be well. So well-being must be taken from others rather than shared equitably in community. Um, and the second aspect I'm only going to touch on very briefly because other speakers can and have spoken to it better um, is the idea of health as disconnected from the rest of nature and from land. Um, yeah, the belief that humans are separate to and above nature and that the well-being of health and humans is to be extracted um, from nature via a relationship of dominance. Um, and key to this is, of course, the violent destruction of other philosophies, um, such as indigenous philosophies. Um, so to end, I think, um, I'm going to end on a slightly controversial, well, not, not controversial, it's a very well established point, but people don't like hearing it, is that we're also taught that health workers and medical institutions are always good because of the pledge to do no harm, and whereas actually... Um, yeah, and like I'm training to be a doctor, so that's the position I come I'm saying this from. 
Medics have been and still are key arms of colonial and state violence. Um, and this is actually a criticism I have of the Green NHS programme, is that um, the UK at the moment is really intensifying the deepening of relationships between doctors and the Home Office, where like reporting on migrants, reporting on undocumented people is becoming a core duty of health professionals. And if we take a climate and health justice lens to our health system and our health, yeah, and our, the way that our, and a climate, what a climate justice based health system would look like, um, it would not be one which collaborates with the Home Office to deport refugees. Um, and so to end, um, I think it's important to say that problematizing, which is of course what I've kind of spoken about today, is only part of the work. Um, but most of my work is as an organizer for health and climate justice, trying to build enough power to um, fight these industries and systems of oppression. So I ask myself all the time, if like if we have a radical, different, more expansive view in health, how can we use that to build power? How can we use that to serve our communities? Um, and so to conclude, I think I will just end on, I think that there's so much potential in expanding the intersection of health and climate to really engage people, not just to motivate people to reduce emissions and to tackle the climate crisis, but to build societies and communities and economies which are designed to meet everyone's needs in symbiosis with the rest of nature. Um, so yeah, I'll hand back to the chair. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Rhiannon. Some really powerful thoughts there for us all to seriously consider. Um, I think you've provided a lot of provocations and Hopefully in the panel discussion, we will be able to unpack those a little bit more. But um, the politics of disposable life, as you know, is such a um, core area that we need to be looking at and deciding what are we going to do about this. So uh, many thanks for those thoughts there. And finally, um, uh, we have Professor Deborah McGregor. So I'll welcome you now, Deborah, to uh, complete the presentations and then we'll be moving to the Q&A. So welcome, Deborah. Thank you. A bookend. I feel like I'm going to say everything that Veronica that Veronica may have mentioned and others. Um, so uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, or late morning or very early morning, wherever you happen to be in the world for this uh, panel. Welcome and happy to be on it um, with like-minded folks. I don't always have that experience in a lot of what I call the climate change circles that I find myself in. Uh, like uh, Rianne pointed out, sometimes we say things that other people don't like, like capitalism, and uh, so <laughs> in in some of these other other circles, um, I, I I don't want to repeat what others what others have already said, but um, but I did want to reflect a little bit on some of my um, experiences in climate assessment, particularly in health, um, as part of IPCC and also as part of um, Canada's assessments, and. And I do find that, um, as others have pointed out, a lot this long history, and I take an Indigenous perspective to this, primarily also a First Nation um, perspective, because I tend to work with First Nations more so than Inuit, Métis in, in the Canadian um, context, is that Indigenous peoples have already experienced a lot of dramatic change um, and survived and transformed in order to be able to do that. And these are the big challenges that I call the disaster reports are putting out. So the IPCC reports that come out and point to how terrible everything is, or the IPBS reports, World Water reports, and they're all calling for transformation. And society is having a hard time, you know, um, doing that, as, as many of the, the panelists um, have pointed out. But Indigenous peoples have already had to do that. Like Indigenous peoples, and particularly in the Canadian context, um, it's too short of a panel to get into a lot of the colonial history, but you know, recently for us, the Murdered Missing and Indigenous Women's Report, Truth and Reconciliation Report pointed to um, genocide. So we've had the face our annihilation before, like I'm here speaking to you as an Anishinaabek person, um, and it failed because we, we survived. So we, but now everybody else is facing their annihilation and now there's a big panic about it. So, um, so I do think Indigenous peoples have a lot to contribute to these broader uh, conversations around what transformation can look like and also solutions. Because depending on how you define what the problem is around climate change, as others have pointed out, what's the root cause of it, will also determine what you understand the solutions um, are going to be. So what I, what I did want to point out in terms of, of health is that um, in the um, 
assessment work that I've been asked to do, you know, where I have to talk about risk and vulnerability and assessment for North America, First Nations in North America, and I have 400 words to do it for, for an assessment is, it's, a, it's still a very siloed approach. It doesn't really reflect in my view, the way indigenous peoples experience climate change, actually probably anybody, and, and how that lines up with what solutions are. So for example, um, research, a lot of us are engaged in research. So there's risk and vulnerability, there's monitoring, there's, um, there's uh, mitigation, then there's adaptations, maybe governance, usually, usually not talked about a lot in relation to indigenous people. How do we start governing our own um, climate health impacts in our communities versus always feeding into other people's plans and strategies and, and processes. But people don't experience climate change in a siloed way. So the way that people um, approach and try to figure out the solutions is very siloed. Um, so I could be with adaptation people, with mitigation people, or with monitoring. There's a lot of money being pumped into monitoring. And um, and it's all very, but people don't experience it that way. They're experiencing it, for lack of a better word, in a very holistic way. And I think we probably need to do better in terms of making those connections. I was glad to hear about planetary health. That's actually where a lot of my own research is sort of heading in that way, because I think it aligns more with what I hear a lot of knowledge holders and elders say in the work that I do, like a big part of the, the underlying root cause, as uh, Rianne pointed out, and others is this lack of connection to, well, Mother Earth like the way that Mother Earth is being treated. Climate change is almost like a logical outcome of the abuse of the Earth for like countless generations. Like, why are we surprised? Um, and so um, it, it's a way that the, the Earth is, is responding to, um, to what's happening. And what I find in some of the climate change circles that I'm finding myself in is people are starting to have a very um, this isn't the right word, but bad attitude towards nature. Nature is like terrible has a vengeance on people. I'm like, ah, that's kind of scary kind of ideology to start adopting at this time, um, I find in relation to, to health. So I see health very much related to planetary health. Um, and I'm starting to become more attracted. I call it more planetary well-being and probably will call it earth well-being because um, the health of people is very much tied to, to the earth. And now folks are starting to develop more thinking um, around that um, social, political, and ecological determinants um, of health, which is very much related to, um, to the health of the planet. So um, I feel like probably I should talk about what's, what, uh, what's happening a little bit in the Canadian context. I won't read the whole list of um, impacts, but I will say that um, I was pleased to see in the Health as a Changing Climate assessment um, there was a, a chapter written by the, uh, prepared by the National Collaborating Center on Indigenous Health, so actually Indigenous authors to contribute a chapter to this, um, where they did talk about what I call the other C words. Um, so often when I'm in the, what I call the climate change circles, the, the mainstream climate change circles, they don't, they all want to talk about carbon, how do we reduce carbon, which is fine, we, we need to have that conversation, but they don't like colonialism. They don't like to hear capitalism. They don't like to hear consumption. They don't like to hear how gender is also a major <laughs> is a major consideration in a lot of this um, in a lot of this work as well. They don't um, don't really like to to go there because you know electric cars isn't going to solve that. Um, so so what I do, um, but what is what I do try to explain to people is that colonialism matters. Um, in, in the conversations, because what it does is it limits Indigenous people's ability to be able to respond to climate change in the way that they would like. Um, what I found in, in some of the, again, the climate assessment work that I've been doing is there's a real lack of recognition of governance and resilience in relation to Indigenous peoples, how, like the wildfires, people being evacuated, floods, all kinds of other natural, what people call natural hazards in the literature. And how do people um, respond to this and come out the other side? And a lot of it is the same factors that enable us to survive to the present day despite um, genocide. So it's um, our culture, our language, our ability to be able to connect to the land, um, intergenerational resilience and being able to, um, to share um, in order to share knowledge. So I, I look to um, those as factors in my work. Often people don't think about how does language then relate to health? How does language relate to planetary health? But one of the things that we know, well, a number of folks know, comes out of the United Nations and other people are starting to um, engage in this, this research um, more locally is that, um, you know, 20% of the Earth's surface is, I prefer to say caretake, because some people don't like 
the word manage because we're not managing the earth. It's probably actually the other way around. And um, uh, by Indigenous peoples, and that's where 80% of the biodiversity is. And it's also where Indigenous languages are spoken. So I see language revitalization efforts is also contributing to the well-being um, of Indigenous peoples and the earth. And that's often like people, I don't understand what language has to do with climate change or adaptation or, or um, moving towards more of a, a governance approach where Indigenous peoples can self-determine what their own future is based on how they're, what they understand um, and experience the problem to be and how they want to um, approach solutions. And I just got to check here to make sure I'm, I don't have the one minute warning yet. Uh, I don't think I got the one minute warning yet. So, um, so we do know that indigenous people's societies have been severely disrupted by colonialism. You come out the other side. Um, what, are, what are some of the ways, what are some of the thinking around what some of the solutions might be to this? In, in my own work, I focus a lot on indigenous knowledge or um, different words people use for this. I noticed in the recent um, Special Rapporteur's report, he, he, want, he is sort of moving away from traditional knowledge, which is in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. That's another place a lot of climate scientists and <laughs> don't like to go. They don't want to hear about Indigenous rights. They don't want to hear about how UNDRIP has anything to do with <laughs> as a solution for uh, or an approach, a path forward to deal with climate change is, um, I don't know where I was going with this, uh, was in, in a lot of these, um, in a lot of these um, spaces that Indigenous people get to self-determine what their own future is based on their own, um, what their own um, solutions are. Um, I think I'll, what I'll try to do is conclude, because essentially what I'm doing is summarizing what a lot of people said and applying it in the Canadian context is, what we see now is the recognition that others have pointed out of um, Indigenous knowledge. Oh, the UN Rapporteur, he's calling it Indigenous scientific knowledge. So they're trying to move away from this is all knowledge in the past and, it, and it's not relevant now. So they're starting to come out with different vocabulary. I just noticed that within the last few days I was researching um, the websites for, for other reports. Um, and, and that's what they're, they're starting to say is how indigenous knowledge in Western science can help, um, can help us address the big challenges that we're facing. Because I will say that indigenous communities also wanna make the best decisions they can in relation to um, climate and health. And sometimes you like you need to have Western science for that too, um, and and they would need to have that in a way that makes sense um, to support decision making um, and governance. So in the Canadian context, there's new, um, I guess, direction that's coming out as part of our client climate science 250 plan and now implementation, where Indigenous leadership, climate leadership is recognized, um, Indigenous led research around climate is being recognized. And, and, but the problem is nobody really knows what that looks like. <laughs> it's there, but then what does that exactly look like in terms of, um, in terms of knowledge? I think what I'll end by, by saying here, I have all kinds of notes, but it's time to stop, is that um, in my experience, I find that in the work that I do, I, I can't speak on behalf of all indigenous peoples on the planet, obviously, is that indigenous peoples um, already have climate knowledge um, indigenous peoples already, they, they have an experience, um, experience climate change more um, dramatically, the more vulnerable to climate change because of this close relationship to the earth. The tension there is that that relationship to the earth is also what sort of um, enables resilience and adaptation um, and a future. So there's, so, there's, um, so there's a tension there. What's happened is it hasn't really been mobilized into these other spaces for people to really take up in, a, in an appropriate and respectful way as opposed to a, an appropriation way or an extractive way. So those kind of relationships still need to be um, still need to be built as well. So um, yeah, so hopefully that sort of was a good kind of book end <laughs> without repeating everything that everybody already said. I thank my other panelists for the amazing comments because I listened to everybody go, oh, okay, I'll cross that off my list. Okay, cross. <laughs> um, and so it's a uh, um, amazing work um, by my fellow panelists and, and looking forward to the conversation. Jimmy Gwetch.
Thank you so much, uh, Deborah. That was incredibly uh, interesting listening to your perspectives as well. So what we'll do now is um, we just have a, a few minutes to um, move to this Q&A session now, and I'd like to invite all the panellists to join me as we turn to this section of the session. Um, so I will get started on this Q&A, and I'll try and operate multiple screens at once to sort this out. Um, Sharon, I think there's a question for you that you've started to answer um, in in the in the chat section, but from Kirsty um, around are the patterns of um, inequitable displacement and effects that you illustrated around the floods are they the sim are they similar for bushfire impacts as well? Would you like to elaborate on your answer for that? Yeah, thanks, Kirsty, for the the question. Um, yeah, I, I think I was saying in the response that. Yeah, we're seeing the inequitable uh, response and displacement uh, taking place for all sorts of uh, of events. Um, there was a, a an analysis uh, done uh, for the the bushfires here in Australia. There's been extensive analysis done for many of the hurricanes that have happened in North America, um, showing that it was you know the affluent people who could get out of town. It was the affluent people who could easily uh, relocate and start up life somewhere else. Um, they were the, the communities who were most able to then uh, return and you know, rebuild uh, in a comfortable way if they so choose. Um, there was also an analysis that showed um, you know, Kim Kardashian flew in her own private fire um, firefighters uh, with the fires in the US uh, before. And so, you know, if you've got the money, you can have your own um, firefighters to come and sort you out. So uh, I'd say that glibly, but I don't mean that glibly uh, in the sense of, yes, the, the marked, marked inequities in ability to respond and uh, move uh, are quite profound. And of course, that's got a long tail uh, of the uh, the effects on our um, post-traumatic stress disorders, and long-term anxiety, sense of, of well-being, sense of hope uh, for the future um, is very unequal, uh, partly because of uh, these, uh, these after effects. Thank you very much, Sharon, for answering that question. Um, I might move to uh, Bob. I see you've started to answer a question from, from Na in the Q&A. Would you like to expand on your response and these questions um, around um, this being an ethical issue? So how are multinational companies, for example, governments and even individuals, um, how, can we, how can we push uh, more successes in, in that realm? So, Bob, would you like to answer that question from Na? Sure. And I think I tried to type it out. Uh, yes. Um, what I'll say in my response was, uh, I do not think um, it should be a question of just holding multinational companies responsible, but we need to hold all ourselves responsible because the climate change problem is a collective action problem, which, which means We've all contributed somehow one way or the other. Uh, it is important for us to appreciate the fact that uh, we live in systems which are connected, especially uh, that natural human systems are connected to natural systems in ways that have resulted in some of the problems that we face. So um, in a nutshell, yes, we may be quick in uh, attributing blame to some entities, but then we should first uh, accept our own contribute our own actions and inactions in the uh, the creation of the problem. I Thank think you. that's the response. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much, um, Bob. Um, there's also a comment in here from Sue that do do people from the government sector, um, so the public sector, get to see and hear these sessions that we're recording right now? 
Um, and she notes that she generally feels that these sorts of sessions are preaching to the converted. And I think that's what many of us probably share in terms of our understanding of who, who is the audience for this. And I think it's good to see um, Belinda's response um, that these these sessions often have uh, representatives from, from the government attending. So, But it is a broader question to us. How do we really ensure that the, these types of conversations reach the people that are needed? And I think that that also points to what we're doing in terms of moving much more genuinely um, to principles around co-design, for example. So involving uh, important stakeholders at the beginning of our work, whether that's a whether that's an activity, whether it's a piece of research. So I think that that's a really important um, question that you pose there, Sue. Um, uh, what else have we got here? So... Um, Another oh, one question from um, Annabelle. Um, I'll, I might pose this question to um, Veronica, perhaps, and this is around um, the barriers we face to um, mainstreaming or operationalising these types of ideas. Actually, maybe I'll pose this to Rhiannon. I think that might be because Rihanna knew really touched on this. Um, so criticisms of, of dominant economic, political and cultural perspectives are unfortunately not always well received. So Rihanna, do you have any thoughts on how we actually um, push forward that with these types of changes, systemic changes, philosophical changes um, to the way we work? Um, yeah, I can come in briefly and then maybe Veronica can also um come in as well because also in many of these situations like i'm one of the people who should be giving up space and power um so i i think just to like i think one kind of key point is that if we locate the problem with the climate crisis in power then our solutions and our work has to be kind of rooted in disrupting power and who has power and who has access to power and that can be within a faculty that can be within community um, but in particular on like the kind of national level and the global level that we need that kind of will require like massive mobilized social movements um, and if we look at who's who has had successes in resisting systemic and powerful violence it's like very motivated very mobilized justice-based social movements um, and like for example I'm calling in from the UK we have like climate deniers in office let alone like people who are like willing to think about the UK's role in in colonialism and delivering reparations um, and I think a lot of the time we kind of get stressed by the Overton window and think about like you know like what's politically possible now rather than the question of how do we build enough power to completely change what's politically possible um, and and I think that um sometimes preaching to the converted is useful in that sense because we can share strategies um we can like share analyses we can share communication strategies um but then we can also think about outreach and how we bring how we bring more people in um and yes yeah, some strategies that i've like learned about recently and are implementing through listening to other people some of them are like big grand scale like decent non-hierarchical organizing and other them is like how to troll fossil fuel companies on Twitter like really well so it upsets them and they have to cancel all their greenwashing sponsorships um so I think there's a lot of like mutual exchange to be had and like I think it's easy to think that we get it like I would like I thought that I got it a few years ago and I didn't get it like so I think constant like expanding our learning um yeah is really key but I'll stop there And, and just to add to what Rhiannon has just said, which I completely agree with as well, I think um, uh, a key a key part of of main mainstreaming these ideas is um, bec because solutions will will come from from community. I, I think we need to really uh, uh, root our our work in 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 community. So place based um, sort of initiatives that. Um, well, well, we do need that that broad advocacy and um, you know influence at the political level, which is really hard. I mean, we've been doing this for for how long? Aboriginal people, Torres Strait Islander people, have been doing it for for decades now. It's very difficult to 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 move that that sort of political uh, will when there's other vested interests that that you know have that power and control. So I think um, also coming from it in a bottom up way working with community showing 
showing, um, you know, governments how it can be done um, by influencing just that local level politics and, and doing well in, in that respect can be um, a real motivator for, for the upper echelons of, of government to, to actually act as well in a similar in a similar way. So I think both that, you know, the double pronged approach, attacking the top end, but also coming coming from a bottom up aspect as well. Thank you, Veronica. Yes, that that pincer, pincer approach. Um, and and Rhiannon, and thank you both for your comments uh, on that. And um, a question from Grant, and I might address this to Deborah. Um, and this is around what steps are being taken to fix lands and people impacted by the nuclear fuel cycle. So I wonder whether, Deborah, you have any thoughts on that, um, I suppose, particularly with the First Nations perspective. And, and I'd just like to add that um, there's terrific work being done on this issue, um, particularly by a group called Original Power in Australia that's led by Karina Nolan. So if anyone is interested in, in the work that Original Power is doing on this issue, please check um, check that out. But Deborah, do you have any thoughts on, on that question? I'm trying to think of what that might mean in the context I'm most familiar with. I mean, um, Uranium and the transportation of um, nuclear energy is, well, hugely problematic for um, Indigenous peoples in Canada. Like the biggest issue that we're kind of facing at the moment is where to store the fuel. And the locations for where to store the fuel happen to be where Indigenous people live. Like they wanted away, way far away from huge populations of people, even though it's supposedly safe. I'm like, well, why not downtown Toronto then, if it's so safe? Um, so, but, uh, um, and the way that it's being approached is to um, find um, their ethical approach is to find a volunteer for it by, you know, waving billions of dollars in front of basically impoverished kind of communities. So it's been taking a really long time to, to cite that. Um, so, so that's kind of, kind of where, I mean, when you, when, when you don't, when you, when you're not wanting to take a certain route in terms of energy, then you need to come up with the other solutions, right? You need to come up with the other, because nuclear is being proposed as, well, it's clean, um, it's, kind of, it's kind of the narrative. Um, without the whole life cycle of the, the nuclear energy, it's very siloed in how it's approached, like nuclear waste management deals with the waste, a different one deals with processing, the production plants are completely, they're regulated differently, so you don't have the, again, the way that people actually experience it um, on the ground. So. It, so the, to me, it becomes more a question of, all right, if we don't want um, the nuclear, because it, then it was youth who said, well, if you stop producing it, you'd solve half the problem in terms of where to then um, store it. It's being stored right now and then buried um, or being proposed to be buried is what are going to be the other sources of power then? Like, where is energy going to come from? Um, and so that's, that's as I think maybe, I don't remember who it was, which one of the panelists pointed it out. How do we start making like a just transition to different forms of energy in different, um, in different communities? And what does that mean? And what kind of decisions do they have to make around, um, around that? Um, I'll stop Sorry, there just because I don't have a yeah. lot of experience with thank that you. in the way that the question was posed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, and we're running short of time, but I wanted to um, allow Eugenie to answer a question to round out the group. Just quickly, if you can, Eugenie, what should Australia be doing in terms of looking at um, accelerating the transformation of our own healthcare sector? Um, so please, a couple of quick thoughts on that before we wrap up. Um, yes, yeah, so advocacy is vital here and there's some fantastic groups in Australia that have been advocating for a national sustainable healthcare unit and ambitious emission reduction targets um, for many years now, whether that be the AMA, DA or the Climate and Health Alliance and also our colleges are coming on board. So advocacy groups and working within your cohort to demand action is really vital and at, pleasingly, because um, Australia doesn't have a national sustainable healthcare unit or state-based ones, so New South Wales and Western Australia are, have recently formed state-based units, 
but the Federal Department of Health ha are at the moment actually advertising for a director for a new climate change and health policy team. Um, if anyone's interested, the applications close on Friday, actually, I believe. Um, so there is increasing um, appreciation that there does actually need to be federal coordination for the sector um, to get its own house in order. And from my perspective, I come to this in the fact that I think the healthcare sector can lead and not just on decreasing its emissions, but also on ethical procurement and um, how it practices um, medicine. Um, we've done that before in um, other areas that have been important in public health and um, we need to do it again and be part of the solution. Thank you so much, Eugenie. And there are many more questions that um, were posed in the Q&A, but unfortunately we've run out of time. So I'd like to um, welcome back um, Professor Fred Gale, the co-chair of the organising committee, uh, to say a few words. Uh, thanks, Catherine. And uh, I know we're running uh, a little over time, so I'll uh, uh, keep this uh, short, uh, but I did uh, really um, just want to... Uh, say I'm delighted um, with the panel in terms of the launch of Global Climate Change Week. It's just been marvelous to listen um, to such uh, rich reflections on, uh, on the intersection between uh, climate, health and justice. And of course, as a, as a professor of politics and international relations, I'm delighted we ended up um, uh, discussing uh, power, uh, uh, just transition and all of these uh, larger uh, larger political economic issues that are at the end of the day um, have to be wrestled to the ground um, uh, if we are going to see the transition uh, that we need. Um, I'd like to uh, thank the panelists, of course, but I'd, I'd really like to thank uh, Catherine for an outstanding uh, moderator role. Um, very difficult task to do to uh, knit everything together and to keep things flowing and I think you did a fabulous job so a big thanks uh, to uh, from me for that I'd also like to thank uh, the organizing team sitting uh, sitting behind the the scenes here uh, from Utah's events um, particularly uh, Sarah and Belinda for doing such a fabulous job um, it's been uh, pretty uh, pretty smooth running all in all um, and of course, I'd like to thank the audience for showing up, uh, particularly those from Australia for uh, showing up so early in the morning um, uh, and perhaps in the UK for showing up so late at night. Um, uh, it's been it's been uh, it's been fabulous. Um, I hope you are all inspired by our speakers. Uh, it seems to me we were just getting starting. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we could have used another hour or so uh, maybe to uh, to really flesh out some of the issues and answer the questions. Um, but uh, it's always good to leave an audience uh, look, wanting more. Um, and uh, I guess um, I hope you're inspired uh, to, uh, to get involved in Global Climate Change Week, um, both by uh, checking out some uh, of the uh, other events that are going on this week, but uh, even more importantly, perhaps by considering uh, taking some action yourself in 2023. Thank you. And back to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Fred. And now, please, everyone, join me in thanking all of our guests for this session, Veronica, Bob, Sharon, Eugenie, Rhiannon, and Deborah. So many thanks to you all. Um, as, as Fred said, um, there's many more events happening in, in this um, celebration of, of uh, climate and, and health. Uh, and so really, you can find out more and register for the upcoming sessions on the Island of Ideas website, or you can use the direct link we've provided in the chat box now. Um, and this talk will be available soon as a video and as a podcast via the university's Island of Ideas website. So please share with your friends and colleagues if you're interested in really spreading the word around this important issue. Uh, next Tuesday, the 18th of October, um, you can attend uh, another online panel session called Food on the Move, also brought to you in collaboration with Global Climate Change Week. And thank you. I'll just finish up by thanking you all for joining us this evening. We wish you all the best and hope to see you online again soon. So on behalf of my fellow speakers, the University of Tasmania and Global Climate Change Week, good morning, good afternoon, good night. <laughs>